Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Today, we celebrate the 10th anniversary of the 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act, the CVAA, which was enacted on October 8, 2010. As you'll hear in a few minutes from our panelists, the CVAA updated our nation's protections for people with disabilities in the areas of telecommunications and video programming. The CVAA contains groundbreaking provisions to enable people with disabilities to access rapidly evolving 21st century technologies and gives the FCC an important role to play in ensuring that access. Today's program recognizes all of the stakeholders, including the industry and consumers who embrace the spirit of the CVAA by optimizing accessibility in their respective spaces. As you will hear, the FCC has taken many steps over the last 10 years to ensure that enhanced accessibility promised in the CVA became and becomes a reality. The FCC's Diane Burstein, Susie Rosen Singleton, and Will Shell will, pro will provide highlights of some of those actions. In addition to these regulatory activities, the FCC has also promoted the goals of the CVAA by facilitating conversations among the disability community, the industry, and thought leaders through our Disability Advisory Committee, also known as the DAC. DAC co-chairs Isidore Niangabo and Brian Scarpelli will give their consumer and industry perspectives over the past decade. Following this panel, we will have a 15-minute break before we begin this afternoon's Chairman's Awards for Advancement in Accessibility also known as the Chairman's AAA. Today, we will recognize three distinguished individuals who have contributed to the advancement of accessible communications throughout their careers. FCC Chairman Ajit Pai will provide a keynote address and we will hear from each of our three winners. For now, let's welcome Diane Burstein to start off the CVAA panel. Thank you all again for joining us and I'll turn things over to Diane. Thank you, Patrick, and welcome to those of you joining us virtually on the FCC's live stream. We're here today to celebrate an important milestone in the history of disability rights, the 10th anniversary of the 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act. Earlier this year, the FCC recognized the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, which included many groundbreaking provisions to ensure access to telecommunications for people with disabilities. But the ADA was adopted before the advent of many new communications technologies and Congress as a result passed the CVAA to modernize the nation's accessibility laws and to give the FCC new tools to keep up with changing technologies. As then President Obama said when he signed the CVAA into law 10 years ago, the CVAA, quote, will better ensure full participation in our democracy and our economy for Americans with disabilities. The CVAA will make it easier for people who are deaf, blind, or live with a visual impairment to do what many of us take for granted, from navigating a TV or DVD menu or sending an email on a smartphone. It sets new standards so that Americans with disabilities can take advantage of the technology our economy depends on, end quote. Congress gave the FCC many important tasks under the CVAA, which for the first time imposed accessibility obligations on IP delivered programming and digital devices, web browsers built into mobile phones, user interfaces on television sets and other digital equipment, and so much more. It's loosely divided into two titles or sections. Susie Rosen Singleton, Chief of the Disability Rights Office, will discuss Title I, which addresses access to advanced communications services and equipment, among other things. Title II, which Will Shell, Attorney Advisor and DRO, will address, covers requirements for accessibility of video programming for people who are deaf or hard of hearing and people who are blind or visually impaired. 
Over these 10 years, the FCC has been extremely busy implementing the provisions of these two sections. And if you'd like to take a deep dive into all the rulemakings and associated proceedings, they're all listed on the Disability Rights Office website. Susie and Will will explain some of the important highlights of the FCC's actions in these areas in just a few minutes. The CVA is important not only because of these significant new provisions ensuring access to modern communications for people with disabilities. Congress in the CVAA also set the agency on a path of reaching out to stakeholders outside the FCC to engage in an important dialogue about how to ensure continued accessibility as innovation continues. Even though the CVAA mandated committees addressing emergency information and video programming wrapped up their work years ago, the Disability Rights Office had carried that important work forward through the DAC, as Patrick just mentioned, where different stakeholders continue to provide the FCC with valuable input into new developments to ensure that people with disabilities continue to have access as technology progresses. The report that the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau of the FCC released yesterday, pursuant to the CVAA, details many of these innovations in the advanced communications area. For example, smartphones, apps, speech to text, text to speech technology, voice assistance, and smart speakers have made significant improvements in the lives of people with disabilities as industry has built accessibility into the fabric of much of today's modern communications. As technology has moved forward, so have many advances in accessibility. And we have the CVAA to thank for spurring that progress on. We're proud of the role that the FCC has played in helping to bring access to new technologies for millions of people with disabilities. And I look forward to today's discussion. With that, I'll turn it over to Susie Rosen Singleton. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. I am Susie Rosen Singleton. I'm speaking currently. Hello, everyone. And thank you for joining us for the 10th anniversary and celebration of the 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act, the CVAA. As you've heard before, it really has made a huge impact on millions of people with disabilities and their families as well. Actually, it impacts about 60 million Americans have disabilities. So that number is really increasing. As we know, we are all only temporarily able-bodied. So with that, I would like to share with you Title I and the highlights in Title I. First, um, talking about the requirements. There are now new mandates to improve accessibility for people with disabilities to modern communications. So for advanced communication services and products, they need to be accessible to persons with disabilities. And so what are advanced communication services? There are four different categories. The first is interconnected voice over internet protocol or VOIP, V-O-I-P services. Second is non-interconnected VOIP services. Third is electronic messaging services. And fourth is interoperable video conferencing services. So that really means that ACS broadly includes text messaging, email, instant messaging, and video communications. It includes gaming and two-way live communications on the web. So for example, chatbots, you need to have two live people on, so one live person on each end. It's not like speaking to a machine. So for example, Siri or Alexa, that is driven through artificial intelligence and does not apply. It needs to be a live person, but that is covered by our rules. 
and it needs to be accessible to persons with disabilities. Another requirement is that web browsers on mobile devices must be accessible to people who are blind or visually impaired. It's now considered to be a ramp to the internet for mobile devices. Third, hearing aid compatibility is now extended to telephone-like equipment using advanced communication services. So for instance, wireline using VoIP. It also, the CVAA Title I updates the definition of telecommunications relay services to include people who are deaf blind and to allow for communication between and among different types of relay services and users. The FCC is also authorized to ensure reliable and interoperable access to next generation 911 services for people with disabilities. And so what transpired from that requirement was that the CVAA allows for the establishment or chartering of the Emergency Access Advisory Committee. That committee, the EAC, EAAC, included a variety of groups of stakeholders to release nine reports about the most uh, effective and efficient technologies and methods by which to enable equal access to um, services by individuals with disabilities as part of the nation's migration to NG911, which is next generation 911. This led to rulemaking proceedings around text to 911 and transitioning from TTY to real-time text, which has had a huge impact for persons with disabilities who rely on text communications. The second component of Title I is accountability. The CVAA Title I creates industry record-keeping obligations through the RCCCI, the Record Keeping Compliance Certification and Contact Information Registry. And the CVAA Title I also requires changes to complaint and enforcement procedures it tightens deadlines for the FCC to respond to consumer complaints. Uh, there is a six month requirement. And it also requires biennial reporting to Congress by the FCC. As Diane already mentioned, some of the key information within that report was released two days ago, and it is available on our website as well. And finally, it also, uh, targets the Comptroller General to issue a five-year report on the FCC's implementation of the CVAA. GAO already did release such a report in 2015. And the key takeaway was focusing on public outreach effectiveness. So that is a priority for us. And the last accountability aspect is to require interconnected and non-interconnected VoIP service providers to contribute to the TRS fund. Now, the third component of Title I is the expansion and availability of resources. There are two major aspects here. The first is to require an FCC accessibility clearinghouse to make available to the public information about accessible services and equipment that is not accessible for them in one centralized place. That can be found on our website at www.fcc.gov accessibility. The second part 
is uh, along the resource concept is of course the National Deaf Blind Equipment Distribution Program. The CVAA Title I requires the allocation of up to $10 million per year for the interstate TRS fund for the distribution of specialized equipment to uh, deaf blind individuals who are also low income to enable these individuals to access telecommunication services, internet access service, and advanced communications. The NDB EDP program is actually known as I Can Connect, and it is available in uh, 56 states and territories. I did want to share with you one example, one shining example of how this is a flagship program for the FCC. During the pandemic, one person whose name is Isabel, who is a staff member of a Michigan I Can Connect program, was working with deafblind consumers at the beginning of the pandemic to ensure that they could get critical medications and food when the state was about to shut down. She told us, without I Can Connect, many of those consumers would not know about the pandemic, or they would not know that they needed to get groceries before 11 o'clock in the evening. She really said that, um, being connected is vital to our community, and I Can Connect played a huge role in that. So that is um, just a, a lot of different fronts where this has made such an impact and changed the lives of people with disabilities. And again, you have accessibility gateways for the mandates. The first is accessibility gateways. You also have accountability measures, stakeholder engagement initiatives like the NDB EDP and the EAAC. The CVAA really made a huge difference. So now we're gonna have the second portion, Tile 2. I will turn it over to Will to expand upon and share information about Title 2. Thank you. Um, before, before Will begins, I did want to let the audience know one more thing. You are welcome to send us questions for this panel. We will be answering questions at the end of this session. If you email livequestions at fcc.gov, Please do so, send us questions. We want to, we are going to save some time at the end to answer your questions. So with that, I will turn it over to Will. Uh, <clears throat> thanks. <laughs> yeah, definitely send in your questions. Um, it would be nice to uh, be able to respond to those. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Will Shell. I'm an attorney at the Disability Rights Office. Uh, at the FCC, and uh, you just heard from Susie about the FCC's rules regarding telecommunications, and now I'm going to broadly cover the FCC's rules regarding accessible video programming. Um, these are rules that were brought about by the CVAA, so um, let's get into it. So on, on the whole, um, our accessible video programming rules cover access to emergency information on TV, uh, closed captioning requirements, audio description requirements, and ensuring accessible ways of using and, uh, and activating these services. So let's start with the emergency information. Um, <clears throat> the FCC's rules require the broadcasters and cable operators uh, that they have to make certain emergency information accessible to persons who are deaf or hard of hearing uh, and to persons who are blind or have visual disabilities. Uh, specifically, emergency information that is intended to help protect life and health or safety uh, and property. Those things must be provided in both an auditory and a visual format um, when, when they're being broadcast on TV. 
uh, these are things, uh, these are events uh, that you are all probably familiar with, like tornadoes and fires, um, but also pandemics. <laughs> pandemics are, are uh, if there's emergency information on the TV, it has to be accessible. So uh, there's not a specific method that is required to make this information accessible. Uh, traditionally, it's visible um, or visibly accessible by showing a crawl of text along the bottom of the screen. Um, but it could be done in other ways. Uh, whatever the method, it should not block the captions and the captions should not block the emergency information. Um, now, making that visual information accessible uh, auditorily um, is traditionally accomplished by a synthesized voice that reads the emergency information that's in the text crawl and it reads it out on the secondary audio channel. Uh, now, <clears throat> I feel pretty confident that not a lot of people know how to access their secondary audio channel. Uh, that's been my experience, um, but we'll, we, will, uh, we will get into that in a moment. There's, there's a lot going on in the secondary audio channel. So um, the secondary audio channel uh, sometimes is playing Spanish language version, a Spanish language version of the program that you're watching. Uh, sometimes it's playing audio descriptions, which we're going to, which is also part of the CVAA, so we're going to talk about that. And sometimes it's playing a repeat of the primary audio track. Now, when there's an emergency, that secondary audio channel is auditorily playing out loud the emergency information. Uh, so it's critical for blind people to be able to hear, uh, hear that. Now, closed captions, we're going to jump to closed captions. Closed captions are uh, also part of the CVAA. Um, the rules right now require roughly 100% of TV programs that are shown on, well, it's a little bit of a repeat, pro, <laughs> video programming that is shown on television generally has about 100% requirement to be captioned. There are some programs that are exempt, but those are pretty few and far between. So captioning of TV programs ensures that viewers who are deaf and hard of hearing, that they have full access to the video program, to what's being shown. But as we all know, we all benefit from closed captions. They're used by tons and tons of people who don't have disabilities. They're on in the airport, the captions are on in the uh, bars or in the gym, uh, and they are used uh, tremendously um, but they also provide access to television, so it's, it, uh, to people who are deaf or hard of hearing. Our rules require that the captions meet some quality standards. So uh, very briefly, they have to be accurate, they have to be synchronous, they have to be complete, and they have to be properly placed. Um, the rules distinguish between pre-recorded programs and live programs and, and near live programs. Uh, and the rules explain how the standards apply to each type of programming. And it recognizes that there's greater hurdles involved with captioning live and near live programming. Um, and our captioning rules goes beyond the television. Uh, the FCC's rules require that captioned programs uh, that are shown on TV, they, they also be captioned when they're re-shown on the internet. Uh, there are some nuances with this rule uh, regarding video clips, um, but in general, programs that are shown on TV, they have to be captioned uh, when they're on TV, and then later, when they're shown on the internet, they have to be captioned there as well. Um, let's keep going. We'll jump on to audio description. So right now, the FCC has a rule which requires that the most popular channels, they have to provide described video on the secondary audio stream. So in case you're not for, uh, familiar, uh, audio description uh, is audio narrated descriptions of a television program's key visual elements. This is typically the, the key visual scenes in a program, such as the setting, or the costumes or the facial expressions. Um, and they're just added in 
to provide context. And the descriptions are inserted into the pauses of the program's dialogue. So normally you would listen to the description by turning on the secondary audio stream. And our rules right now require that the local TV station affiliates of ABC, CBS, Fox, and NBC, which are located in the top 60 TV markets, that they have to provide 50 hours per quarter of audio described prime time and or children's programming. So also the top five non-broadcast networks, which are Discovery Channel, History, TBS, and uh, HGTV, and USA, they also have to provide that same amount of 50 hours per quarter of video described prime time and or children's programming. Now, all of those networks also have to provide an additional 37 and a half hours per quarter of audio description between the hours of 6 a.m. and midnight. Uh, it can be, it, it doesn't have to be prime time or children's programming, it can be anything in there. That amounts to about a total of seven hours per week of audio description per channel. Um, and just like before, there's a lot of other nuances within <laughs> within the programming. There's certainly more than seven hours of content for audio description, but um, but that's uh, kind of how the rules are laid out. Uh, I just want to mention that two days ago, the FCC announced that they were considering expanding the number of markets that will need to provide audio description. And if it's adopted, this would add 10 more market areas per year for four years. Let's move on to the accessible user interface rules. Uh, this is also under Title II. The main point that I want to make here is that uh, why have all the accessible video programming services if you can't use them, right? Like uh, accessible emergency information, audio description, closed captioning, these features need to be turned on and off. And in the case of emergency, emer emergency information, it needs to be turned on quickly. Um, so what we're talking about here is the FCC's rules requiring set-top boxes to be accessible uh, and all devices that play video programming to be accessible. Um, specifically, accessible user interfaces for people who are blind or visually impaired. This rule allows people who are blind or visually impaired to be able to operate and use all or nearly all of the functions of a device that plays video programming. To, this is the, you know, the settings and the menus, uh, channel selection, being able to read through the program guide. Most of the time, this is accomplished through a speech synthesizer again. Um, and this, but it technically, I guess, could be done through other means, but. Um, it has to be, many of these rules require that it be audibly accessible. Um, our rules have separate requirements for cable, satellite, and fiber TV services. And then there are separate requirements for all other devices that play video programming. And the differences between the two categories is, you know, small, but you should know that there's a difference. Um, in short, cable, satellite and fiber TV services have to provide an accessible set-top box experience to people who are blind or visually impaired right now at no additional charge. And, um, um, and, and, they, and they have to make getting this uh, accessible feature easy to get. They have to have an, a, a website that lists who you can speak to to find out more information. That person has to be able to explain how to get one of these devices and also how to turn on the accessibility functions on the device. Now, all the other devices <laughs> um, that play video programming, they also have to have an accessible user interface. Um, these are things like TVs, just plain old TVs, smart TVs, uh, tablets, smartphones, Removable media players, uh, which are you know things like Apple TVs and Roku's and Amazon Fire Sticks, uh, computers. Computers can play video programming. 
Um, and um, even, uh, even things that you wouldn't imagine, like uh, a smart refrigerator, right? If your smart refrigerator has a, uh, a screen on it and it can play video programming, then it has to have accessible controls so that you can uh, operate it, so that it can work. Um, so the accessibility rules apply to these devices and any pre-installed apps that come or, or video players that come with the device. Uh, and these devices are out there. You can find them. Many of you may have them and don't know that they have accessibility features uh, already built into them. Um, anyway, I'd like to emphasize <laughs> at this point <laughs> that um, this isn't a trivial matter, right? Uh, video programming, TV, uh, this is this is a, a really important area of, of our lives. Uh, blind people and people with disabilities watch just as much video programming as people without disabilities. Uh, we pay significant amounts of money for these uh, devices and for the subscription services. And video programming is uh, it completely intertwined with our society and culture. Um, and uh, we shouldn't be left out. So uh, finally, all of these devices they have to have a simple and easy to use mechanism to turn on and off the secondary audio stream, something like a button key or icon. And if you can't turn on and off the secondary audio stream quickly, uh, you will not be able to listen to the emergency information. Um, and the same goes for closed captioning. You have to be able to do this uh, easily. Um, so I'll leave it at that. And now I'll pass it on to Isidore uh, Miangabo. Hello. Uh, thank you for inviting me here to with you today to celebrate a, a, an essential uh, protocol for us at the deaf, hard of hearing and deaf blind communities the 21st Century Communications Video Accessibility Act. It really is impactful and has changed our lives incredibly in the last 10 years. One of the most important parts of the CVAA when it was passed, it gave us in the deaf community uh, and organizations within the deaf community like the NAD, the opportunity to advocate for uh, internet accessibility, for uh, watching television stations like CNN, for watching Netflix, for providing captions for those. For, it allowed us to have full accessibility to those uh, particular services. So deaf people were missing out on many things. There were situations where there were emergencies uh, that were in crisis. For example, now the pandemic that's happening, uh, it's possible uh, that if you were on business travel or you needed to find some communications previously, we would have difficulty finding that information. Now with my mobile device, I can pull up CNN through an app or the internet and it provides captions thanks to the CBAA. Uh, another important part is our ability to use relay service providers and how they are used. Previously, we could not use them interrelatedly. I could not use VRS with my family. Perhaps members who use TTY, I was not able to make those calls. Now, thanks to the CVAA, I am able to call through VRS. The interpreter can, can connect and communicate through a relay service to the TTY and my friends or family who are deaf or deaf blind, but are getting a message through a written language and they need it in that format, they are able to do that. And that is an important improvement the CVA has provided. I also remember, uh, I think in 2010 or thereabouts, I was in a library uh, studying. Uh, I was with some hearing friends who were uh, on the library watching uh, a computer and I was unable to do that. Uh, there was a, a problem with my ability to communicate and have access anywhere that I wanted to go. Uh, another important improvement specifically for the deaf blind community and the blind community overall is of course the video description that has had a huge impact. 
now that we can access the knowledge of what's happening on in the background, background noise. If I'm watching a movie on Netflix, I'm able to know what is actually happening in the film, in the background, without having to hear it. You know, sometimes we're hearing people are getting subtle information from background noise. It was difficult for the deaf community to figure out what that was. And now both with video description for the blind community and captions for the hearing community, it is better, uh, we have better device compatibility, which means that we can stream it. For the blind community, we now have uh, braille displays. So that audio to text means that they now can uh, discover that information through braille, which is an incredible improvement. So a, a very important uh, improvement that uh, I have to say, I was chatting with a friend of mine who is hard of hearing and uses a cochlear implant. And sometimes he prefers to do his interviews independently. Because of the CBA, he can connect directly with the hearing person through FaceTime. And he can actually hear very clearly because of the technology and how it connects to his implant. And that means that people who are sitting around or near him do not have to overhear that conversation. And he continues to maintain his confidentiality and was absolutely thrilled at that kind of improvement that has occurred because of the CBAA. I definitely think the CBAA has helped aided and relieved some of our challenges and has provided an incredibly important foundation for our future and us as consumers we can continue to provide feedback to the FCC and make recommendations to continue to update the CVAA and through rulemaking proceedings, uh, et cetera. And it allows for stakeholders to continue to be involved. It also provides technology providers the ability to communicate with us and the community. And hopefully we'll continue to comply with the CVAA. And as we continue to improve the CVAA, uh, we certainly have a high number of deaf people per capita in the top 25 cities. Uh, and most of those deaf people, for example, in Austin, Texas, uh, they are not uh, a part, uh, they are not necessarily a part of that, but because there's a huge deaf community there, uh, they are hoping to be sort of all covered underneath the CBAA, whether you are in Austin, Texas or Hawaii, we want to make sure that their TV captioning and accessibility is ready to go. And uh, thanks to the CBAA, that means that we will continue working on the future. And I look forward myself to continuing to work to make things more accessible and inclusive and better for all people with disabilities in this country. And I want to thank people for, uh, for who are working on this with us. And I look forward to continuing that work and, and thank you for uh, letting me share today. And I believe I am handling, handing it now over to my coach, Brian, who will continue on with his comments. Thank you so much, Isidore. And thank you all for the opportunity to uh, participate in this wonderful celebration today. I'm very honored to share an industry perspective on uh, developments in accessibility over the last 10 years and on the, on the CBAA. Uh, just a, a brief note about myself and my organization. We, uh, the ACT, the App Association is a, a not-for-profit trade association that represents about 5,000 small business software uh, developers and connected device companies across the mobile economy uh, uh, that, uh, that, that and, and really uh, we're, we're developing the software and hardware that connect smart devices and, and, and create innovative solutions to make lives better, uh, all lives better around the world. Um, uh, approximately uh, 5.7 million Americans employed in our industry and growing. Um, and we are so invested in advancing accessibility because our members provide that touch point to the mobile technology uh, uh, revolution really, which uh, continues to create new efficiencies across consumer and enterprise contexts um, healthcare, manufacturing, and, and on and on. So, uh, you know, without without question, we're, we're committed to providing all users, including those with disabilities, with an equivalent experience. And uh, our organization's committed to assisting uh, technology developers in incorporating the needs of, of, of uh, end users uh, with disabilities uh, at large and, 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 uh, and helping them ensure that accessibility is considered throughout the product development process or 
accessibility by design, as some call it, very important concept that, uh, that we work to promote and advance as part of our commitment to accessibility aside from the law. And I can say with, uh, with total confidence that this is a commitment that's shared by all of the industry. So on the CBAA, I, in my view, without question, the 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act of 2010 has been a driving force behind so much innovation and disability access on covered products and services, um, telecommunications and advanced communication services and equipment and internet browsers built into mobile phones. And as I look back over the last 10 years, it's very interesting and compelling to me to think about why the CBAA has been such a success. I think of two reasons. Uh, first, I think that it's really important to remember that the CBAA, while it, it, it is a law that has requirements, has prioritized flexibility for the industry. And what do I mean by that? I mean that the FCC has, and I believe as Congress intended, provided its expectations for the outcomes without mandating how we get to that goal. And that has provided lots of room for collaboration and innovation within this CBAA framework. And it's given the, in, from the industry perspective, it's given the industry um, the ability to learn uh, continuously and to focus not just on making things functional from a disability access perspective, but more inclusive from the start and to exceed the requirements of laws and regulations. And uh, that commitment to inclusion, I think, uh, rather than just functionality, is one that we have all benefited from. Second, I think it's worth noting that the CBAA has facilitated very uh, helpful collaboration amongst industry and consumers and others impacted that we have never seen before. And uh, it's a great model for future laws and regulations, in my personal opinion. Um, you know, I think Isidore will probably agree with me that one of the key venues for this collaboration has been the Disability Advisory Committee, which I'm very pleased to co-chair with him, but also other parts of the CBAA framework, such as the Pathway to Compliance, um, which has, um, I think, already been addressed here by my FCC colleagues, but that has gone a long way to create, uh, to foster a collaborative and efficient pathway to raising and resolving accessibility issues for covered products and services. And I commend uh, the FCC and the FCC staff for uh, taking this approach. So the, uh, and, 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 and I, you know, those, those reasons for success, but, uh, you know, that, I, that I'm talking about, I think the world we live in today looking back 10 years, today it reflects the benefits of a flexible and collaborative approach. I think, you know, the communication sector has developed at an unprecedented clip with new high capacity networks available to, to most and many Americans, including those with disabilities, which has unlocked a, a, a huge amount of new capabilities. A, a very basic example would be that video calls are far more easily available and smoother and, 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 and accessible today than 10 years ago when voice calls were the norm and the baseline. And we're only starting to realize the benefits of that new high capacity 5G networks uh, will, uh, will provide, um, particularly in the context of disability access. And that's very exciting. Uh, but also, you know, moving, uh, uh, down a layer, I guess you could say that uh, uptake of devices by consumers generally and those with disabilities has also fueled a, 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 you know, all boats to rise and, 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 and greater accessibility. Uh, new, to, new telecommunications and advanced communication service devices are far more affordable compared to 10 years ago today. Um, I think a really compelling statistic to share is one from the wireless RERC. Uh, which, uh, which has, has released data showing that in, in 2018, 97% of people with disabilities reported owning or using a wireless device with 88% of people reporting owning a smartphone. So imagine what those numbers are today. Those stats are already two years old. <laughs> uh, and these devices it's, uh, are, are highly customizable, increasingly customizable and reflect great efforts to provide interoperability between platforms and products. These are aspects that we simply didn't enjoy 10 years ago and I really can't under, underscore how important they are. 
So moving another layer very quickly uh, is, um, is uh, past improved infrastructure and device availability, I think uh, is, is, the, is the widespread availability and proliferation of software apps. Today, over 4 million apps are available generally. And that, that's, that's monumental. You can't, you can't put a, a value on, on, on all the different ways that those software apps have, um, have unlocked new capabilities and efficiencies and, and provided a, a level playing field in many cases. Um, and, and how they've enabled accessibility features and, and I you know and, and, and I think that also the software platforms are due some credit too. They, they have some, some leading accessibility features that, that the apps that are provided to consumers, uh, uh, through the platforms, uh, you know, that, 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 that are provided through the, the platform functionality, they enable the apps. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, there are really too many apps to talk about to give them, and I'd love to give them all the credit they deserve, but just to share an example or two, or, or two that, that, that came to mind as I was thinking about today, um, Avaz, A-V-A-Z, is an app uh, uh, that was developed for children who are nonverbal and have, have difficulty speaking. It helps facilitate communication in children with autism, spectrum disorders, Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, very interesting um, and, and, and compelling use case. Um, there's others, Microsoft Scene AI app helps people with vision impairment convert visual in, uh, information into audio, so many more um, and so many more in development, including addressing use cases that, that we're not thinking about. So in sharing the industry perspective, on developments in accessibility over the last 10 years and, and reflecting on the CVAA, I don't think anybody can deny the successes that, that the CVAA has, 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 has made the United States uh, plow forward with in advancing accessibility. Um, without, uh, without question, um, there are most certainly further challenges that will remain. And, and I think uh, some of the solutions that Isidore just offered uh, for fur further ways that we can collaborate um, through the CVA construct are going to be key. Um, and, and some of those are discussed in the uh, very comprehensive CVAA biennial report that was just released yesterday, which, uh, which uh, Diane mentioned, uh, which is, is uh, I, I strongly recommend folks to go and take a look at that, that important report. It's very good. Um, I think that ultimately the framework we have in place because of the CVAA and constructs like the Disability Advisory Committee that are under that CBAA uh, umbrella make the future for accessibility very bright. So uh, that, that concludes my remarks. And I, I do just would end with saying thank you again for the opportunity to share uh, these views here today. Thank you, Brian. And thank you to all the panelists. Um, it's really been a fascinating discussion about the CBAA. And I want to remind people who are watching that you can send your questions to livequestions at FCC.gov. Uh, we have a couple of questions that we've received I wanted to pose to the panelists. I, I guess I'll start with Will. Uh, we, got, we had a question, Will, about the quality of captioning and specifically um, the quality of captioning that applies to uh, television programming, does that apply to programming that's streamed, um, streamed uh, program, video programming or not? Maybe you can uh, speak to that a little bit. Oh yeah, this is, this is Will. Now, um, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm happy to talk about that. So the caption quality standards, you know, um, which was just to, just to refresh all of our memory, uh, is accuracy, synchronicity, uh, uh, or uh, being synchronous, uh, completeness, and being properly placed. Um, those quality requirements uh, can, you know, the the um, the impact of of those or the the amount of perfection that you need to get depends on whether or not, really, just on whether it's pre-recorded and you're watching it, um, you know. Uh, on a scheduled time or whether it's live programming or near live programming. When it goes to the internet, um, I think that the, um, the <laughs> I think that the uh, quality standards would continue to apply on the internet 
but it may be the case that it is being shown on the internet after the live programming. So it may actually need to go up in quality standards, but there may be people who are more familiar with uh, the captioning details, with the uh, fine details than me, but uh, that, is my, uh, that is my understanding. Thank you, Will. Anyone else on the panel have anything, uh, any thoughts on that, Susie? Hi, yes, this is Susie speaking. Uh, I did want to comment on that. Yes, you are correct. When it goes to the internet, it must be the same quality as it was shown on TV. And I just wanted to share a little story about that because uh, we've heard from consumers, Isidore in particular, about how important the consumer experience has changed when you have the CVAA requirements in place. One example of that in the pre-CVAA time, I personally saw something online and I knew they had been captioned on TV. So I contacted that particular station and let them know, uh, can you please caption it on the internet? And I was very surprised to be informed that there is no requirement, therefore we are not doing it. So now I do want to warn everyone, it's not uh, only the CBA, it's an incredible amount of cooperation and collaboration with industry, of course. Some go beyond the, the upper boundaries uh, that are required at this point. You see that with many original programming on the internet. That it's not did not start on TV, but it still has captions, though it is online. So uh, I also want to put out that the FCC's coverage is focused on that is programs that has been on TV first, but there are also other applicable laws like the Americans with Disabilities Act, or there are state and local laws as well. So please keep that in mind when you are looking at requirements. There may be other possible ways to cover or address that type of uh, issue. I also want to highlight not only for captioning, but the CBA does so much for audio description as well as Will described what is required now. But the CBAA actually created the, the reinstated the rules from 2000 that the FCC had enumerated but was thrown out. So the CVAA allowed that to really reinstate these rules, which is a huge change uh, for the community and millions of people who now can effectively find their information uh, on and programming. So now I'm going to go back to Diane to continue with other questions. Thank you. Um, we got another question from the audience about audio description. And uh, Will, I think this one is for you as well. Similar to the question about uh, video streaming and caption, the question really relates to services like YouTube um, and Sling that don't have audio description. Do the FCC's audio description rules apply to these types of services? Uh, this is Will. It's a really good question. So the the FCC's rules do not apply to um, pro video programming that is not on those very specific channels that I mentioned. So the top four broadcast channels and the top five non-broadcast channels. So programs that are shown uh, on on streaming services even if they were shown on TV with audio description, um, they are not required under our rules to have audio description on the streaming service. But a lot of streaming services are providing audio description uh, just uh, voluntarily. So, um, oh, that's Claude, hi Claude. <laughs> um, so there are a lot of uh, streaming services that are doing this without the FCC's requirements. Um, I, and, uh, but that's, that's basically the answer. There's no FCC requirements for streaming services to play audio description. Thanks, Well, We have uh, one last question and um, then we're going to have to stop.
stop this panel and uh, get ready for the next. Just want to pose another question from the audience. Can you provide an update on the status of third party clips for captioning? Um, Susie, I think this one is for you or for Will, if either one of you wants to take this one. Thanks. Sure. Hi. I'm happy to take this one. And Will, you can add if I've missed anything. So for video clips, we have different types of rules than we do for full length video programming that is shown on the internet after it's shown on TV or concurrently as is shown on TV and online. For video clips, they must only be captioned if it is on the MVPD's own website, the video programming distributor, if it is on their own website. So let's say it's CBS, for example. If it is on their own website, then it must have, all the video clips must have that there. But for third party websites, we have an open rulemaking and there's a question on that specific issue. We have already received comments from the public and we certainly appreciate your feedback. At this point, we have not released any further uh, information or actions. We will keep you updated and you can keep up with our, work, with our work if you please will subscribe to our Access Info newsletter, which we will put out through Access Info. So people will be kept up and know about any movement in any area of disability access related work within our agency. Uh, anyone have anything to add? Well, thank you, Susie. And thank you panelists for uh, coming and joining us today. And thank you to the virtual audience. Uh, we're going to wrap up this panel and take a short break. And we'll be back at 3.15 for the Chairman's AAA Awards. So please come back and join us. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 2020 Chairman's Awards for Advancement in Accessibility. I'm Patrick Weber, Chief of the FCC's Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau. This is the 10th year of these awards, which we affectionately call the Chairman's AAA. We're happy to have you with us today. Those of you who have attended previous Chairman's AAA ceremonies know that they're traditionally held in a ballroom with a live audience. The chairman hands the winners a fancy trophy while photographers capture the moment. But like so many other things, this year's ceremony will be different due to COVID-19. We are making use of some of the innovative communications technologies that we have all gotten to know so well over the last six months to host a socially distanced ceremony in front of an online audience. You've probably noticed that there are, there are other windows around me currently displaying our ASL interpreters. Our speakers, including our three winners, will be appearing on screen individually to deliver their remarks during our ceremony. To keep the ASL interpreters visible, we will only have the current speaker on screen along with them. Since 2011, the Chairman's AAA has promoted innovation and accessibility by recognizing the development of technologies that improve the lives of members of the disability community. And just to mention a couple of examples of our past honorees. In 2011, one of our awardees was the LookTel Money Reader, an application to help blind and visually impaired consumers identify the denominations of their currency. And in 2016, one of our awardees was the SOS QR, which functions as a personal support app for consumers with cognitive disabilities to provide quick and easy notice to emergency contacts and display a QR code for first responders to access in an emergency. This year, the Chairman's AAA has changed its focus to recognize individuals who have contributed to the advancement of accessible communications. Those being honored today are national thought leaders who sustained excellence throughout their careers, have served to advance the cause of accessibility in telecommunications technology through policy, advocacy, and design. 
To tell you more about the awards and to deliver our keynote address, I'm honored to introduce a leader who has championed the use of technology to improve communications for all Americans and has ensured that people with disabilities remain a focal point of our policy work. He's the 34th chairman of the FCC, Ajit Pai. Now, unfortunately, a last minute scheduling conflict prevents Chairman Pai from delivering his remarks live, but he was able to record his planned remarks just a short time ago, which we will share now. Thank you for that kind introduction, Patrick, and welcome to everyone watching on the live stream of the 2020 Chairman's Awards for Advancement in Accessibility. Now, internally, we call them the triple A's. Obviously, we are not the first to use that acronym. Fortunately, minor league baseball, the tiny batteries lobby, and America's largest auto club have graciously refrained from suing us for trademark infringement. In a first, we are holding this event online because we are still, of course, living through a once in a century pandemic. While 2020 will always be remembered as the year of COVID-19, it was also a year when we celebrated two important anniversaries. In July, we celebrated the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, or ADA. And as you no doubt heard on the earlier panel, today marks the 10th anniversary of the 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act. Now, when thinking about how best to commemorate these anniversaries, I'm reminded of the words of the legendary civil rights champion, John Lewis. In an essay that was published upon his passing, he wrote that, and I quote, democracy is not a state, it is an act, unquote. Each new generation must build upon the progress made by those who have come before. The ADA and the CVAA were both landmark achievements and we rightly celebrate their passage, but they are not the end of the story. They are just important chapters reminding us that the rest of the story remains to be told. We should and we must build upon that progress. Flowery speeches on anniversaries are nice and appropriate, but action that enables innovations that benefits individuals with disabilities is better. And for the past decade, the FCC has been working to fulfill the promise of the CBAA. And for the past four years, I'm proud to say that we have been able to continue this forward momentum. For example, we reformed the Internet Protocol Caption Telephone Service, or IPCTS, eliminating hundreds of millions of dollars in waste and helping to ensure that this critical communications service remains sustainable for Americans with hearing loss who need it. We also allowed service providers to use fully automated speech recognition to produce captions as part of our IPCTS reforms. This technology reduces the delays between the time that words are spoken and the time that captions are displayed. We ensured interoperability of video relay services by incorporating technical standards and establishing an interoperability testing laboratory. We also authorized direct video communications between sign language users and customer service call centers. We also increased the amount of audio described programming that certain broadcast stations and channels must provide to consumers. We increased accessibility to live news programming on smaller stations by hosting a forum and engaging with stakeholders of the FCC's Disability Advisory Committee to develop a Disability Advisory Accessibility Toolkit for stations. We extended hearing aid compatibility requirements for wireline phones to consumer equipment for advanced communication services, including a volume control requirement for wireless phones. At the start of the pandemic, we quickly approved waivers for telecommunications relay service providers to give them more flexibility to deal with reduced staffing and increased volumes, to enable more of their employees to provide services from their homes, and to expand the pool of contractors qualified to provide American Sign Language interpretation services. And these waivers, which we have extended several times, have helped ensure that consumers can access relay services during the pandemic. And on top of all that, we are still hard at work. Just this week, I shared with my fellow commissioners new rules to expand our audio description regulations 
by phasing them in for an additional 10 markets each year for the next four years. If adopted, our rules regarding audio described programming on broadcast stations will soon reach the country's 100 largest television markets. And six days from now, our Disability Advisory Committee will meet to discuss new technologies for captioning live TV programming and best practices for creating audio description, among other topics. Now, obviously, this is not a complete list of all of our activities at the FCC, but you get the point. We've been pretty busy. And when I say we, I mean the amazing staff at the FCC, starting with Diane Burstein and Bob Aldrich in our Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau. Our Disability Rights Office is filled with professionals dedicated to improving access to modern communications for the disabilities community. They also have two outstanding leaders, Susie Rosen Singleton and Elliot Greenwald. Now, recognizing these talented coworkers who have made remarkable contributions to the cause of promoting accessibility is a natural segue to talking about today's AAA winners. Through these awards, we recognize individuals and companies who have brought us closer to the goal of full inclusion. From the many nominations received, we selected three exceptional people who have advanced the cause of accessibility in telecommunications and media in different ways. Today's winners exemplify the perseverance and commitment of individuals who truly care and have dedicated their professional careers, indeed their lives, to the advancement of accessible communications. Now, to save some suspense for Patrick Weber's presentations, I'm not going to call out by name each of the winners. But if you're watching this, you'll know who I'm talking about. Now, the only reason our first honoree has never won a AAA is because she was previously ineligible, because she worked at the FCC. Seriously, if you were to build a Mount Rushmore of legendary FCC career staff, she would be etched into that stone. She helped to write landmark legislation in support of accessibility and spent decades working on behalf of consumer organizations. She helped lead the coalition of over 300 national and regional organizations, which played a critical part in the enactment of the CVAA. She even wrote the book, and I mean literally, she wrote a book on making telecommunications services accessible for deaf and hard of hearing Americans. And for many years in the FCC's Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, she led our policy making on accessibility matters and offered many her wise counsel, including me, for which I'm deeply grateful. Now, second, we also recognize a tireless advocate for the deaf and hard of hearing. For 23 years, he led a consumer organization that promotes equal access to telecommunications, media, and information technology for consumers across the country. For 18 years, he chaired a national coalition of consumer and professional organizations focused on promoting collaboration on public policy and legislative matters. He is a man whose stature and work has left an indelible mark on how communication services are delivered in America. He was also no stranger to the FCC, serving distinguished terms on both our Consumer Advisory Committee and Disability Advisory Committee, including service to the FCC and the American public as chair of the Disability Advisory Committee. And last, but certainly not least, we recognize an industry leader extraordinaire, someone whose 30-year career has transformed the landscape of accessible technologies. He has championed and directed highly innovative and impactful technologies at Comcast and AOL. His work opened the door to enhanced access to video programming for consumers who are blind and visually impaired. He personally showed me the innovations in accessibility that he and his team were pioneering during a visit I made to Philadelphia a few years ago, a visit that still lingers with me to this day. And his work on the Disability Advisory Committee helped advance an important dialogue between industry and consumers to benefit individuals with disabilities. Now, since we cannot be together in person, let me show the awardees and our audience at home a sample of the Chairman's AAA Award. Here it is. 
as one might say, the award is in the mail. And with that, let me congratulate each of today's uh, awardees and thank all of you on our live stream for joining us. I'll turn it back over to Patrick to present today's awards and simply want to congratulate everybody in this space who has worked so hard to advocate for and to succeed in promoting the goal of accessibility. Congratulations to all of you, especially today's awardees. Back to you, Patrick. Well, thank you, Chairman Pai. Um, and uh, certainly the chairman sends his regrets for not being able to join us live uh, today um, on our video stream. Um, I've been with the chairman over the last three years, the last three chairman's AAA award ceremony. I know, I know how much he looks forward to each year uh, giving out the awards in person. Um, so without further ado, let's, let's go ahead and turn to the, the awardees. Um, our first 2020 Chairman's AAA Award winner certainly needs no introduction, and particularly around the FCC. Karen Pelt Strauss, her work as a telecommunications attorney and advocate has spanned decades. I, along with many of my FCC colleagues, have had the opportunity to witness her passion and dedication firsthand during her time at the agency. Her efforts on behalf of people with disabilities, specifically in the space of telecommunications access, are unparalleled. As the chairman mentioned, Karen was an instrumental contributor to numerous pieces of significant legislation that have advanced equality in telecommunications access. These include sections 255 and 305 of the Telecommunications Act of 1996, which require telecommunications access and television captioning. Title IV of the Americans with Disabilities Act, which mandates relay services, the Decoder Circuitry Act of 1990, and of course, the CVAA. Karen is highly regarded by consumers, industry, legislators, and regulators, and acknowledged as a trailblazer and leader in this space. Congratulations, Karen. Uh, you can unmute your, your audio, and I will turn the floor over to you. Thank you so much, Patrick, and thank you, Chairman Pai. I'm very embarrassed about that introduction, especially the part about Mount Rushmore. Um, and thank you so much for this honor. But I believe it is I who should be giving you, the FCC, the award. For so many decades, I was lucky to have the opportunity to work with the FCC from both within and outside the agency. Your tireless and dedicated staff has truly made the virtual world accessible for people with disabilities through your policies, your outreach, and your consensus building among stakeholders, which we heard a little bit about this morning. Your commitment to the CBAA's effective implementation, whose anniversary was celebrated in the event that you just had, is just one example of your efforts to um, ensure that transformative technologies reach the disability community. And I'm so proud and extremely humbled to be sharing this honor today with Tom Lukowski and Claude Stout. I can think of few other individuals who have done more to advance disability equality Tom, through your brilliant work in helping companies achieve accessible design, and Claude, through your unrelenting advocacy on behalf of consumers. Living with the pandemic this year has been quite challenging for all of us, but it also highlights the vital need for disability access to digital technologies. Front and center to our ability to get by has been our access to online services for our jobs, our healthcare, our news, information, and shopping. Over the past six months, I, and likely most of you, have participated in just about everything online, conferences, birthday parties, religious services, and even weddings and funerals. I can now add to this list receiving an award. Who could have ever imagined this? I know I couldn't but we can all take comfort in knowing that the laws that we have worked on together have given people with disabilities the communication tools to cope with this new reality as well. We don't know how long this wholesale shift to online services will last, but we do know that the need to ensure full digital access has never taken on greater importance. New technologies like artificial intelligence, virtual reality, augmented reality, promise so much to people with disabilities in terms of independence and integration, but of course only if protections ensure that people with disabilities and aging adults are equal participants. And I'm so happy to have 
listened to Andrew earlier and um, learned about um, all the things that the industry is doing. And uh, it's just re remarkable how much the industry has done in terms of uh, taking, taking matters way beyond what the law had originally required. I am confident that the future will be as bright as the last 10 years have become for people with disabilities in terms of information and communication technologies. For your continued work on digital inclusion and for this wonderful honor, I give you my deepest gratitude. Thank you so much. Thank you, Karen, and congratulations again. <clears throat> Our next winner of the 2020 Chairman's AAA is Claude Stout. Claude spent decades as the Executive Director of Telecommunications for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing, TDI, effectively advocating on their behalf. His work spans technological generations, from TDI's iconic work distributing their blue book of TTY numbers, to his efforts with the Coalition of Organizations for Accessible Technology, or COAT to helping to develop and advocate for passage of the CVAA. Prior to his time at TDI, Claude worked on behalf of people with disabilities at the state level in North Carolina and Missouri. Throughout his career, Claude worked collaboratively with industry to achieve positive outcomes for consumers, participating in a variety of advisory groups and committees, including, as the chairman mentioned, our DAC and our CAC, He's also participated in many panels and conferences. Claude has been a stalwart, stalwart ally to all, whether they be regulators, government agencies, consumers, or private businesses. Congratulations, Claude, and I will turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Mr. Weber. And thank you, Chairman Pai, for your comments via video. And thank you so much for this. Uh, it's such an honor to receive this special recognition from the FCC. Particularly as we have the utmost respect for its initiatives for disability access. It really is a huge honor for me, as I'm sure for Karen and Tom. And a huge congratulations and hands waving to both Karen and Tom as well. So now I would also like to uh, recognize the FCC's office's profound contribution. I know the last 24 years of my career in public service, the commission has the commission has been incredibly open in involving us and including us within their meetings. Uh, I want to thank them for including a for including us in our in their policy level meetings as advocates and including us as members on the various advisory committees i also would like to thank at this point the industry that has made every effort to design and develop accessible technology that effectively meets the needs of their customers and consumers including those with disabilities Working together over the years, we have come to see the benefits of universal design and that it is a win-win outcome for all of us. So I also want to thank our friends in the business community. Thirdly, I want to thank our sister national organizations of, by, and for the deaf and hard of hearing, including those with mobility, issues and our deafblind community members. They 
and the academic research entities that work with us have offered input and expertise. Hi, everybody. Um, it looks like Claude's um, screen has frozen. Um, we're hoping that we can get him back online to finish his remarks. Um, in the meantime, I think we will continue with um, our, our ceremony here and hopefully we can reconnect with Claude so he can, he can finish his remarks. Um, but uh, my congratulations again and the chairman's congratulations again to you, Claude. Um, we will move on to our third awardee and hopefully come back to Claude if we can reestablish um, a connection with him. So our final winner of this year's Chairman's AAA is Tom Lukowski. Tom currently serves as the Vice President of Accessibility and Multicultural Technology and Product at Comcast Corporation, but his career innovating for people with disabilities stretches well beyond his current role. Tom has contributed to advancements in accessibility for the last 30 years. Prior to joining Comcast, Tom served as the Director of Accessibility at AOL for over 10 years and also held positions at the WGBH Media Access Group, home to the Descriptive Video Service, Caption Center, and the National Center for Accessible Media, or NCAM. He has been a tireless innovator, helping to push for increased access to video programming, broadband, and connected technologies. Notable among Tom's many accomplishments is his work overseeing the development and deployment of the Xfinity Talking Guide, a groundbreaking innovation that revolutionized access to video programming for people who are blind or visually impaired. Congratulations, Tom. Please turn on your camera and your microphone and the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Weber. Uh, thank you, Chairman Pai, for this unbelievable and incredible honor. Um, hard to believe I've been in this career 30 years. Uh, truth be told, I started when I was 12. <laughs> um, definitely when I had hair, I know that. Um, and I just first want to begin by recognizing uh, my fellow uh, awardees, uh, Karen and Claude. Uh, it's been my pleasure to work alongside Karen and Claude for many of the 30 years that I've been uh, working on accessibility. You know, as Chairman Pai said, you know, Karen literally wrote the book on telecommunications access. And uh, it's been our job in industry to, to find a way to catch up to her vision. Uh, and Karen, your, your work, I believe, has really led to uh, where we are today in the industry where accessibility is really become a business imperative uh, for companies who want to be credible in the media and technology space. There absolutely needs to be a focus on accessibility and that's due in large part to your leadership. Claude, I can't say enough about the help that you've been to me uh, over my time at both AOL and at Comcast. You're always willing to serve on a round table to meet with our product designers um, and to meet with me individually and to find a slot for us at the TDI conference when I call you at the last minute, seeing if there's an opportunity to present. Um, your work, your tireless work to advocate for captioning and video relay services and ASL and, and so many other services is, is truly uh, admirable to watch. And I've learned a lot from our time together. This, this award really is, is uh, exemplary of the commitment, the deep commitment uh, and the great people that I've worked with along the way, uh, especially now at Comcast, where 
we have our executive leadership, we have product designers, product developers, product managers, all working to uh, take our requirements and build them into our products so that we can further empower people with disabilities through inclusive technology. From the talking guide to our X1 adaptive web remote that enables people with ALS to use eye gaze technology to independently control their entertainment experience, to now more recently our new ASL call center where customers can speak directly with agents who themselves are deaf. We're barely scratching the surface. There's so much more to do. And I am looking forward to what the next 10 years uh, will, will have in store for us as we move through this technology. So I wanna accept this award, award on behalf of my teammates and the broader team at Comcast and those that I've had the pleasure to work with at the WGBH Media Access Group and AOL because without their support, without the support of my family, none of this is possible. Thank you again to Chairman Pai for this honor. It was a pleasure to host you in our lab to show you some of our technologies. And thank you again, uh, Mr. Weber, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you very much, Tom, and congratulations again. Um, we are trying to reestablish a connection with Claude. I don't, uh, Claude Stout, I don't see that he's, um, he's back online with us. So I'll give it just a minute or so. Okay, I just uh, got noticed that we're trying to reestablish a connection with Claude. Um, his internet service went down briefly, so um, we'll give it just a few more seconds here um, because that uh, that will sort of conclude our ceremony. Um, so we'll give Claude just a, another minute or so to see if we can get a, a reestablished here on our, our video stream. Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, give some closing remarks. If we're able to reestablish a connection with Claude, we will, we will certainly get him back um, on video uh, to conclude his remarks. Um, but I, I wanna just thank everyone uh, for, for being with us today. I certainly wanna thank our winners, Karen Pelt-Strauss, Claude Stout, and Tom Likowski. Um, such a, a great group of, of three individuals who have done so much uh, for the disability community over the years throughout their careers. Um, great award for them to win um, during this, this first year of our uh, online only um, uh, uh, conference or, or award ceremony, but also, um, you know, switching gears a little bit and, and focusing on individuals who, who have contributed so much to the disability community. We are, we are very honored and, and pleased to have them as our, our winners this year as the Chairman's AAA winners. Um, so I also want to just give a shout out and thank you to some of the folks who have worked um, internally on this event um, here at the FCC. So from our Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, uh, thanks to Ed Bartholomew, Zach Champ, Diane Burstein, Sherry Dawson, Kayla Hernandez Ujoa, Gerard Williams, DeAndrea Wilson, Chantal Virgil, Mike Snyder, Susie Rosen Singleton, and from the Office of Workplace Diversity, Dewana Terry. So I see that Claude is back online. This is great. Um, I will 
Claude, if uh, we have your video up, I will um, turn the floor back over to you. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. I'm sorry that the uh, that the Zoom disconnected. My apologies. Either technology can be incredibly helpful, or it can be a curse. So, so I will go back to talking about our third group of thanks to these particular stakeholders, our sister national organizations of by and for the deaf and hard of hearing. That also includes those who have mobility disabilities, as well as the deaf blind community. Uh, I also include academic researchers like Gallaudet, NTID, uh, the Center for Developing Technology, uh, as well as uh, at the University of Maryland, uh, they all have lent invaluable input and expertise, working together to jointly submit over 1,200 filings to the FCC. Without their help, we would not have produced the kinds of results that greatly benefited both the FCC and industry. And so my thanks go to our fellow consumer advocates and researchers. Fourth and last, I extend my deepest thanks to my family, especially my wife, who is currently right next to me, and the organization TDI. And when I say TDI, that includes its members, its board of directors, staff, and key for us, the pro bono legal service entities like Morgan Lewis and Samuelson Glushko Technology Law and Policy Clinic at the University of Colorado Boulder and Institute for Public Representation at Georgetown University. So my thanks to them for their unwavering support. So I want to conclude with the fact that together we will continue to build a better, more accessible world for all Americans. And I say again, thank you. Thank you so very much for this honor. Thank you, Claude, and, and congratulations again. Congratulations to all three of our winners. Um, I want to thank each of you who are viewing this video online with us for joining us today. Uh, please take care, stay safe, and thank you for watching. If I could ask the winners to stay online with us for just a minute or so, we'll, we will do a virtual picture um, that we will post on our website. Um, so this concludes the 2020 Chairman's Awards for Advancement and Accessibility. Thanks, everyone. Be safe.